Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. It's time once again for your weekly wrap up. And this week I thought it might be fun to take a behind the scenes tour of NASA, uh, taken mostly during the end of the space shuttle program and the beginning of the commercial crew program. Uh, we went down there a lot during that period of time and did a lot of coverage. And I've got a lot of cool photos that I never showed you before. So I think it might be kind of fun to take a look at it this week. So let's get to it. Now, I attended the launches of five different vehicles to space. We saw the last three space shuttle launches, and I also have been to two SpaceX launches, and we covered those uh, SpaceX launches here on the channel. Uh, the very first thing I attended was the STS-133 NASA tweet-up. Uh, this began in October of 2010, but it continued over to 2011 because the launch kept getting delayed and then they had a problem with the fuel tank, so they uh, had to postpone it. So this group got together a lot uh, because we were all waiting to try to get this space shuttle off the ground and it was a lot of fun. Now NASA does this still, they call it NASA Social now. And I would suggest you keep an eye on posts from NASA about their socials because you get invited down to the NASA press site uh, so you're there where all the other media are, and it's probably the best place uh, to witness a launch. And they put together a really nice program. You hear from astronauts, you take a tour of the facility. You do have to pay to get yourself down there, but uh, you are invited into NASA facilities after that. And I highly recommend uh, to do this if you have an interest in the space program. Now, following the launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery for the last time, uh, I started writing for a website here in Connecticut called CT News Junkie, and they started up a little tech section that I was writing for. And one of the things about Connecticut is that we have a lot of connections to the space program. So a lot of the parachutes made for uh, spaceships, both here on Earth and the ones that go to Mars, are made here in the state. Uh, the space shuttle had fuel cells made here in Connecticut. Uh, the space suits are made here in Connecticut. So there's a lot of things that were being impacted by the end of the shuttle program. Uh, so I started writing about them for CT Tech Junkie, and then I uh, applied to NASA for press credentials to follow this story to the end, uh, which is the launch of these uh, final space shuttle missions. And they agreed to have me come down as a member of the media, which was awesome. Uh, at the launches and landings, I had a few friends help me out. Uh, my friend here on the uh, right of me is my friend Matt Reese, and this is Tony Land. And we also had another guy, Jay Patterson, who was behind the camera, who likes to uh, not be in front of it. And he helped us get a lot of the photos put together. So what you're going to see are pictures that uh, all four of us took. And I'm not sure who took which one, so I want to give them credit up front that this was a real group effort. And a lot of the images and videos that we did were something that we all did together. Now, Jay, Matt, and Tony all lived in Florida, which made this really convenient for coverage because there's a lot of stuff that goes on down there in between launches, especially during the end of the space shuttle program. So they were able to get over there and cover a lot of stuff that uh, it wasn't affordable or practical for me to cover. So it was great to have uh, some friends down there that could help out with that. And they certainly enjoyed that. I will say logistically, it is very difficult to cover the space program because you have to account for slipping launch dates. So you've got flights, you've got rental cars because you can't just Uber yourself over to NASA property, you have to drive yourself on. Uh, and then of course you've got the hotels. Now the hotel we stay at is this little Best Western which is uh, right on the road that leads to the Space Center. And they've got a Waffle House attached, which is great. It's very affordable, it's a great little place. I think they call it the Space Shuttle Inn or something, but that's been our go-to uh, hotel for many years now. And then Southwest is the airline I often use for flying down there because uh, the launch dates, again, are changing all the time. So it's nice to have an airline that doesn't uh, ding you for changing your ticket. So uh, Southwest was the way we went there. Rental cars are always a nightmare to rebook, but we managed to get it all done and see some of these launches. Now, closer to home, I was able to cover some things that my friends in Florida couldn't do. Uh, this is the lobby of what used to be called Hamilton Sunstrand, where they make spacesuits for the space program. They uh, go back to the Apollo days and earlier. Uh, the spacesuits that are currently in use on the space station are made there. And they also do a lot of the environmental controls on the space station. And they took me on a just a fantastic tour. I've got an article about it on, on CT Tech Junkie that I'll try to link to down below. Saw all sorts of stuff, including things like this vacuum chamber where they were testing out uh, some different devices. And one of the challenges that they were working on at the time was 
reclaiming uh, moisture from the air to turn it back into drinking water because one of the things that the end of the shuttle program meant was that they were not getting as much water delivered to the station rolling forward because the space shuttle uh, used fuel cells and the waste product of those fuel cells, which were used to generate power on the space shuttle, uh, was essentially pure water that they could pump right into the space station and use for drinking and cleaning and everything else. And that was changing, so they had to figure out some new technologies to efficiently reuse water from the air, essentially, in addition to all the other uh, urine recycling efforts that you've probably heard about. It's all real, and it was awesome just to see everything being uh, made and tested there. And all of the equipment that they were making there were really kind of one-off devices because these are used for a very specific purpose, the space station, and they have to be very reliable because you can't just bring them down to repair them on a regular basis. You have to really uh, be able to not only get the stuff up there, but work on it in orbit if need be. So it's a very uh, complicated business, and it was really cool to get such a tour. And speaking of fuel cells, we also took a tour of what used to be called UTC Power here in Connecticut. Uh, they designed the Apollo fuel cells along with the shuttle fuel cells. Uh, this is what those fuel cells look like. This is the Apollo one, and this is the shuttle one. I think the shuttle had three of these on board all the time. And again, these would be generating power, and the byproduct was water. Uh, one of the challenges, though, that they were dealing with was that uh, this was a very one-off device again, and it was designed in the 60s and the 70s, so they didn't have a lot of parts available to keep them operating. And every so often, they would have to come in and get refurbished, and it was getting more and more challenging for them to continue that refurbishment of some very uh, specific devices. And at this point, UTC Power was in the commercial power generating business, just given that the space program was not generating a lot of new business for them beyond the maintenance that they would occasionally do. Um, so it was getting harder for them uh, to keep their business going and support the NASA mission, which of course made it more expensive. Another uh, reason as to why the shuttle had to be decommissioned was its power source here, along with many of the other aging components on there. Uh, and what they were doing also at this facility was supplying hydrogen fuel for fuel cell buses that I believe are still running around the Hartford area. So they had to drive up to the South Windsor plant. They had refrigerated tanks outside to increase the storage density. They would fuel up with hydrogen and then uh, drive to do their bus routes. Now, in addition to seeing the launches down in Florida, we also got some amazing tours of NASA facilities. Uh, this is one of the orbiter processing facilities, basically the hangar for the space shuttle. Uh, these are now used by uh, customers, as they call them, at the Kennedy Space Center, including the military and uh, some of the commercial spaceflight companies. So these have been kind of turned over to other users at this point. Uh, this cutout here was where the uh, shuttle's tail fit in. And it's amazing just how tight the fit was inside of these buildings. And it had to be this way so that workers could essentially access every surface of the shuttle. Uh, so you can see just how tightly packed in it is. This is the uh, back of the shuttle's wing here is what you're looking at. And you can see there's access points everywhere for uh, workers to get in there. Uh, this is the nose gear. They had to change the tires after every flight. Um, they were advising us not to touch anything because if we happened to touch the wheel the wrong way, some sensors would get disconnected and they'd have to do the whole thing over again. So it was very delicate uh, and a very uh, precise amount of uh, work that had to go into each one of these refurbishments. Uh, this door here was where uh, the external fuel tank would attach to the shuttle. So after that fuel tank detached, that door had to close in order for the shuttle to safely come back to Earth. Just so many little components that had to be uh, checked and tested and ensured that they were working safe because a failure of any one of those things would have resulted in a loss of crew. Even something as simple as a small motor on the bottom of the space shuttle could be a disastrous uh, outcome. And the shuttle did not have many ways to get out of it in case of an emergency. Um, the shuttle initially had ejection seats, but those were taking, taken out after the first test flights. There really was no way to get out of it if there was an emergency. And the work that these folks did to keep this shuttle uh, operating safely for as long as it did uh, was remarkable and, and really a credit to uh, their expertise and their dedication to the mission, which was uh, really very apparent when we were out there. Uh, here's just a close-up shot of the tiles on the leading edge of the wing there. I thought that was a pretty cool thing. And speaking of maintenance, um, one of the things that I learned they had to do uh, was inject with a needle 
a waterproofing chemical into each of these tiles. And that's why there's little circles on here so they knew where to make that injection. And that had to be done after every mission. And the reason is, is that these tiles are remarkable in that they're very lightweight and can keep the heat of re-entry away from the uh, delicate parts of the shuttle, but they also absorb water. And in Florida, of course, it's very humid. And when the shuttle would launch into orbit, it had absorbed a lot of water in those tiles. And in orbit, you're going through a number of state changes because you've got very hot periods of time when the sun is in, in view, and then you have very cold periods of time when it's not. So you have state changes going on inside of these tiles. And the initial missions, they find, found that these tiles were just popping off all the time because they were, uh, the, the water inside was expanding and contracting. So they had to inject this chemical to prevent the water buildup inside. And I think the guy was telling me that it takes about two weeks just to do that. And I guess the chemical they were using was very toxic, so they had to clear the place out. So this gives you an idea as just how much more they had to do beyond what they initially anticipated uh, when the shuttle was, was made. Uh, and some of these tiles are newer than others. So you can see this one here has been through a few missions, and these were newer. Uh, each one of the tiles was specific for its spot, and they had uh, very specific instructions as to how to cut out the tile for uh, the right purpose. We got to hold one of them too. It's amazing how lightweight they were. Really amazing technology. Uh, the shuttle was also wrapped in a blanket in other parts and you can see the label here describing uh, what that material is about and you can see it here on the side of Space Shuttle Discovery when we took a tour of that orbiter which was another awesome experience which I'll get to in a minute and you can see although it looks like it's just you know a white metal or white painted metal it's actually a blanket here on the side and you can see the Discovery name uh, printed on that portion right there. And in addition to the blankets, you also had some white tiles that you can see here. Uh, so it's really neat just to see the shuttle up close and see how many different materials were actually on it, even though it looks like it's just painted black and white when it's out there on the launch pad. Now, in addition to all of those tours of the uh, shuttle facilities, we also got a tour of some space station facilities. Uh, this room was where they prepared items that were going to the space station. Uh, so in the back there was a cargo container that was going to fly in uh, the upcoming shuttle mission that was happening uh, around the time we were there. And what they would do is they would load up these containers with cargo. Uh, they would be in the shuttle's cargo bay. And then what would happen would be after the shuttle arrived at the station, they would use a robotic arm to pluck it out of the cargo bay and then attach it to the station. And they did that by grabbing onto these little uh, targets here to do that. And when they attached these things to the station, uh, the station was kind of temporarily expanded. So this was a pressurized space that the astronauts would float into and pull uh, items out of and bring into the space station. And then when they were done with that task, they would usually load it up with experiments that were going back to Earth or garbage or whatever. Uh, and then they would later detach that cargo from the station, put it back in the shuttle cargo bay and bring it back to Earth. Uh, SpaceX has been doing this now for uh, almost a better part of a decade uh, with their Dragon capsule that for a long time wasn't crewed at all. Now it is, of course, but they were able to provide that up and down uh, service that the shuttle uh, was doing prior to its cancellation. Uh, here you can see the shuttle now leaving that uh, processing facility and being taken to the vehicle assembly building. Again, look how tight the tolerances are here for getting this uh, one-of-a-kind uh, device out of its hangar. Uh, there you can see a side view of Atlantis as it's rolled towards the vehicle assembly building. Uh, not too far to go, but you know, you got to be careful. Uh, and there you go, you can see the shuttle rolling over to the big VAB. Uh, you can't appreciate the size of this building unless you're there in person. It is enormous. It was designed to work on the Saturn V rocket that went to the moon. Uh, we have a little video of it here, but again, it just doesn't do it justice. The building is just simply enormous and uh, again, has the ability for technicians to work on these devices as they're stacked up in any position or any spot. Uh, and it's just uh, amazing the scale of, of all of this and just how large these things are that are being uh, essentially fired into orbit. It's just uh, remarkable. So here you can see the shuttle getting lifted up by uh, some cranes here. Uh, it's then brought vertical and then they had to bring it through another portion of the building to get mated up with the tank and the solid rocket boosters. Uh, after the shuttle is stacked, uh, it is brought out to the pad by one of these huge crawlers. These are the same 
uh, crawlers that were bringing the Apollo Saturn V rockets to the pad. And the shuttle uh, was put on top of this mobile launch platform that that crawler would get under and then would take the whole thing uh, out to the launch pad three miles away. The scale and the size and the weight is just crazy when you think about how heavy this stuff is and then you have to bring it all the way uh, to one of these two launch pads. Uh, incidentally, the SpaceX mission we just watched uh, launched from this pad here uh, and we'll be seeing some stuff soon, I think, going from the other pad in the near future as well. Uh, then once the shuttle is out there, it is where you typically see it, on the pad and ready to go. Now this structure here was called the Rotating Service Structure, or RSS, and it would enclose the shuttle up until the night before the launch. And one of the events that the press always looked forward to was the RSS retraction event, where they would bus you out to the spot that you see here in the photo, and you would watch them very slowly pull that uh, thing back to reveal the shuttle. I've got a couple of videos that you'll find in my NASA playlist down below of a time lapse of that retraction. It was really cool to see in person. And again, I, I just can't get over the scale of this stuff. You can see uh, this is a person <laughs> right here, and that's the uh, shuttle, just to give you an idea as to how big everything is. Uh, there's a better shot of it that I took uh, for Endeavour's last mission. Uh, and then uh, Jay, Matt, and Tony got to go to the launch pad uh, while they were getting Atlantis ready. And you can see there the RSS is retract in these, retracted in these photos as well. And I was so jealous that I could not get down there for this because this was like a truly once in a lifetime opportunity. They didn't let the press uh, on the pad often due to safety, obviously. Uh, and they really just kind of opened the door up for everybody to check it out. So that is the solid rocket booster right there, just to give you a sense of scale. Uh, these are the hold down bolts. So the uh, shuttle right before those uh, rockets are ignited uh, is bolted down and they have explosives that uh, cut her loose when she's ready to launch. And there's a lot of precise timing that goes into the ignition of those solid rocket boosters because they can't be turned off once they are started. So they have to be very certain that they can safely launch. Uh, this photo I like quite a bit because it gives you a sense of that scale. Uh, compared to the Apollo rocket. So see here, this is one of the doors that uh, lead out of the vehicle assembly building. Uh, this is the top of the fuel tank. So it kind of goes to that third door there. Uh, check out the Saturn V, right? So again, we're looking at the shuttle ending about right here, uh, and the Saturn V goes pretty much to the top of the building. Uh, the SpaceX rocket is taller as well, uh, and the new rocket that NASA is working on will be equally tall. And I thought this photo was a great way to kind of get a sense of that overall scale of the Saturn V rocket that took people to the moon. Now this special room I believe is called the last bathroom on Earth. It's located about 195 feet up on the launch tower. And if you gotta go before you go, this is where you do it. And I would imagine it's pretty convenient for the workers up at that level to have a place to go as well, uh, because I'm sure many spend the better part of their workday uh, up at that level. I don't know if SpaceX kept this though because SpaceX refurbished that entire launch pad uh, but I would imagine it's good to have a bathroom up there and I bet you it's still there so it might be kind of fun to see if we can get an answer to that. Now the highlight of our visits to Florida was a tour we got to go on of Space Shuttle Discovery. This was after the final mission of Discovery but before they shipped it off to the Smithsonian for display. So this was during the decommissioning process. Uh, so this photo of me is on the flight deck. By the way, all these little blue squares are Velcro because you want to be able to lock stuff down so it doesn't float away from you. So there's, all, there's Velcro spots all over the place, and you'll see that as we work our way into the shuttle here. Uh, just to give you a sense as to where the crew area is, it's basically this spot here on the front of the shuttle, and that is it. The rest of the shuttle is mostly cargo bay and engines. And then, of course, you've got maneuvering thrusters here in the front. So not a very big area of the shuttle for crew quarters. And as you'll see here in a minute, uh, it's quite cramped, but there are some ways to make better use of space when you're in orbit because there's no up or down. Uh, so what we did is we entered through the mid-deck here. Uh, we also went up to the flight deck, which is above it. Uh, the lower deck is not accessible. Uh, and here you can see us going in. Now, one of the cool things is, is that they, they asked us to sign the, the wall or ceiling. They handed me a Sharpie and asked me to uh, sign the wall. I didn't feel qualified to do so, given that I'm just this lowly independent reporter, um, but they insisted, so we did. And I think this white room is on display somewhere. 
Uh, and everyone who has signed this um, are much more important people than me. R. Gilbert there, I believe, is an astronaut. Uh, there was many other astronauts who signed those, uh, those walls, including uh, some who sadly uh, passed away on the Columbia mission. Uh, and here, uh, Matt is uh, sliding into the shuttle. And again, this is the mid-deck through the hatch that the astronauts entered into before they went on a mission. Now, I've got a video of this that you can find in the playlist down below. Um, but this is the mid-deck, and it's about the size of a small bedroom. But what he's telling us here is that you can make use of the walls and the ceiling when you're in orbit because, again, there's no up or down. So it, it's cramped, but it's not as cramped as it would be if you were stuck in this uh, volume on Earth because you can, again, make better use of the space. Uh, that airlock up there would bring you to the space station, and then this is the rear uh, hatch leading out to the cargo bay. And it was just awesome to get that shot just because uh, that was something that we often saw as kids uh, in, uh, in school leading out to the cargo bay in orbit. Uh, this is the flight deck. It's not very big. I would say it's about the size of like a small minivan in there. Uh, so you've got the commander and the pilot seat there, uh, all the flight controls. And then uh, where uh, this gentleman is, who's one of the technicians that uh, worked on the shuttle, um, is where the on-orbit controls are. So his uh, arm there is resting on some of the on-orbit controls. There's some windows there that you can look out, uh, especially if you're trying to dock with the station. I'll show you another photo of those in a minute. Uh, this is where the on-orbit thrusters were located, and they took out that portion of the shuttle because it is filled with toxic gases that they use for those thrusters. So they were replacing that thruster module with one that was kind of a replica for display to make it safe. Those uh, chemicals are highly carcinogenic and they wanted to be very careful about that. Um, so that was neat. This is the cargo bay. So we got to go up a level just to see how they service the cargo bay. Uh, this portion here is what would be docked with the space station. I think there was another piece that was attached to it. Uh, again, they were um, basically decommissioning everything, but it was again, cool just to get all these really close up views of the shuttle uh, during that tour. Uh, these are some of the controls that they would use uh, on orbit. You can see a joystick there for uh, hitting the thrusters, for getting things oriented properly. A lot of neat stuff. And again, you'll see more in that video. Uh, this is back on the mid-deck. This is where the computers were located, a lot of the avionics. And one of the things they were very, very, very careful about was foreign object debris. Um, because in space, let's say I lost my wedding band while I was working on the space shuttle. Uh, that wedding band here is all metal. Uh, in space, once you get on orbit and everything is weightless, that metal ring or that little shrapnel of some piece of metal shaving is going to be floating around and it might short out something that could lead to a catastrophic failure of the shuttle. Um, so on Earth, everything is going to be on the ground where you dropped it. But in space, once you hit orbit, everything just starts floating around. And there was a couple of stories from a, an astronaut. I think he was on the, uh, the first mission of Discovery who was talking about how all this stuff started floating all over the place when they got on orbit that had been left behind during the manufacturing process. So you've got to be really careful about that. Now, this last thing I wanted to show you was just some of the work that the press does to capture these launches on video and in photographs. Uh, so you're allowed to set up remote cameras near the launch pad. You can't actually be there, of course, when the shuttle goes off. Uh, so they bring you out there usually about a day before the liftoff to set your cameras up. And all of the shots that you see of these close-up rockets taking off are usually done from an automated camera. Uh, and there's all sorts of different ways to get those cameras to fire off. In fact, every one of these photographers has some different contraption and strategy for it. Uh, and depending on when that launch is going to be will also depend on how early in the morning you have to get up to be out there. So we were out there at sunrise for this particular setup time. And these were the cameras that uh, Matt, Jay, and Tony and I set up. Uh, we used mailboxes to protect the cameras and then we duct taped some plastic bags to them. And these are just like standard Nikon SLRs on these uh, tripods here. And then Matt set up an acoustical sensor so that it would start firing the shutter uh, when those rocket engines lit up and we had it set to a very high setting given how loud they are. Uh, some other folks just had a very simple timer because the shuttle liftoff time uh, was very predictable if it was going to go and the launch window was usually fixed at about 10 minutes. So a lot of folks just put a big memory card in their camera and they had a timer start firing the cameras off uh, right around the time of launch for 10 minutes just to be sure to cover the full launch window. 
uh, but we went with uh, an audio sensor. Uh, and then we got lucky on our first outing because our second uh, try with this did not go as well. Uh, but this was Endeavor lifting off. We had cameras that were positioned uh, here, which is uh, you know, towards the uh, starboard side of the orbiter here, as you can see. And those cameras captured this. So these were the main engines igniting. Uh, this was another shot from another camera at the same position of the shuttle taking off. We were very proud of that shot. Uh, great stuff here, isn't it? Isn't that crazy? Uh, and this was Matt setting up uh, one other shot that we had. Now, this was something that we didn't think was going to work, and a lot of people said probably would not work, but he wanted to try it anyhow. Uh, what we had was a fisheye lens, and he's probably about, I don't know, maybe the length of a, half the length of a football field away from that concrete there. He's pretty close to the launch pad. And we were not expecting much, but we said, hey, let's give it a shot and see what happens. And when we picked up the camera a few hours after launch, we got this. Isn't that amazing? Um, and we just happened to get a lucky shot here because the frame before the shuttle hadn't really emerged from this uh, cloudy, smoky area. And the frame after it was already in uh, the smoke over here. And we just got lucky that the winds happened to be blowing the right way and all the forces from the engines were interacting in the right way to give us this shot. And that camera was caked with rocket crud <laughs> after we picked it up. Um, but this was the money shot right here. And I think we won a local journalism award uh, for this photo, or I think we came in second place maybe or something. But it was a great shot, kind of a one in a million uh, kind of thing. And what we did is we purposely set the camera shutter to not run full blast. So we had it do um, like a shot every half second or something, just because we didn't want to overload the buffer. We wanted a very consistent shot to keep running until that sound disappeared. And had we had the other setting, the buffer would have been filled and it would have missed the shot. So again, just a lot of good luck here uh, that resulted in a great shot. And we were really fortunate because a lot of folks who do this for the first time don't often have success, yet every one of our cameras worked. Uh, the following launch, none of them worked <laughs> because again, you're setting them up, you're coming back 24 hours later and hoping that maybe they did fire off and many times they don't. Uh, so a lot of the photographers that go out set up a lot of different cameras in a lot of different places just in the hopes that a few of them will be successful. I have a video in the playlist where I interview uh, one of the folks down there who has a lot of neat uh, things that he's developed over the years just through trial and error and every photographer has their own way of doing it. So while our cameras get a front row seat, we are safely kept three miles away at the NASA press site, which is right around where my mouse is circling here. And even though it is three miles away, you do get a pretty good view of the launch because Florida is very flat. So when that shuttle goes off, this is pretty much what you would see with your eyes. And of course, the SpaceX rockets that launch from that same spot will give you a similar vantage point. Now, this photo was taken of Discovery's final launch, and it was a very clear day. Uh, so we were able to see the shuttle uh, all the way uh, to the point where they separated the rocket boosters. And even after that, you could see the engine still glowing as it was pushing towards orbit. Uh, the last two launches of the shuttle program were done on largely overcast days, and you can see this shot here. Uh, we got about two or three seconds of the rocket lifting off before it went into the clouds, and then that was it. Um, so it was a very quick glimpse of the shuttle as it lifted off. But I remember watching Matt's face uh, for the launch of Endeavour, which was the first launch that he went to, and he's like, that was amazing because there's things that you can see and experience in person that you can't appreciate from just watching it on TV. So the first thing that really surprised me, having watched rocket launches for decades before on television, uh, was just how bright the shuttle was at the time it lifted off. The, uh, the rockets are just almost as bright as the sun. It almost hurts to look at them. Uh, and the other thing was just the sound and how long it took for the sound to reach us. It was about 20 to 25 seconds before you actually start hearing the sound and it kind of rolls in and it's so loud and you can feel the air moving like your clothes kind of flap a little bit with the pressure changes from those rocket engines. It's a very unique experience. And I had people telling me who were there for the Saturn V launches that the ground was shaking three miles away. Uh, the pressure from the rocket coming down uh, actually caved in the roof of one of the temporary press buildings that were there. So there's just a lot of power uh, being released on these rockets that is very tightly controlled, but it really gives you an appreciation of the scale, first of all, 
but also just how dangerous this is and how we're barely containing this explosion uh, as these rockets are lifted to orbit. It's just, just an amazing experience that I hope you all can get a chance to do. Uh, we also went to watch the last landing of the space shuttle. Uh, we've got a video of that up. And following that, we watched them roll the shuttle back. And this was uh, taken from a uh, ceremony that they conducted after the astronauts returned. Unfortunately, most of the people you see in this photo uh, lost their jobs the next day because once Atlantis came back from that mission, uh, these folks were laid off. And they uh, had us, members of the press, as part of this uh, ceremony that was taking place. I think partly for us to appreciate the impact that the loss of the shuttle would have, not only for these workers, but for the region as well. Now, there's a fun little tidbit about this photo, and you can't see it in this shot, but if we zoom in a little bit, you can see that there's somebody inside the shuttle. Uh, this was a technician whose job it was to monitor the shuttle systems until they could properly shut it down. I guess the only place you could shut it down properly was inside the orbiter processing facility, and he had to stay in there getting cooked because it was super hot that day uh, up until they could bring the shuttle in and properly go through its shutdown procedures. So he definitely uh, went above and beyond that day to keep that uh, shuttle operating as it should. And of course, if you've ever been in a car on a hot day all sealed up, you know how hot it can get. And it certainly got hot in there that day from what I read. Uh, now, we also got to tour around SpaceX in the early days. Uh, so during those last shuttle missions, they started bringing the press over to SpaceX to start getting some of the story out that uh, SpaceX was going to try and uh, be the replacement for the shuttle program. Uh, there was a lot of doubt around the press site during that period of time that SpaceX would be the company that would next bring humans to orbit. I think a lot of the money was on Boeing to be able to do that, but of course SpaceX ended up beating Boeing to the punch. And this was SpaceX's first facility in Florida at Cape Canaveral. Uh, they had these golf carts that called themselves Falcon Rebel Base, kind of the uh, startup culture at work there. Uh, this is an early video of what they envisioned commercial crew to be. And this goes back to 2011 uh, when uh, they were first uh, getting the commercial crew competition going. Uh, and you can see here SpaceX kind of touting some of their prior accomplishments. And uh, it's kind of neat to see this because they have some visions as to what um, the crew would be doing and wearing on the way to those uh, space station missions. And of course, things look very, very different now. I mean, they do have the touch screens, of course, but they're wearing much more fashionable suits. But you can see the early development uh, videos of how the escape system would work. Uh, but the capsule here looks largely like the cargo capsule that uh, they were using before the Crew Dragon was uh, brought out for this past mission. And apparently, all the future SpaceX missions will be done on the crew version of the capsule, whether they're crewed or not. And they have some concepts also, that, like they can use that escape system to land on hard surfaces anywhere in the solar system. So you can see they had their eye on Mars a while ago, and they still do now. And uh, it's pretty fun just to see how those things developed. Uh, this is the inside of their facility at Cape Canaveral. Uh, we talked a little bit about this during the SpaceX live stream, but they uh, work on the rockets horizontally, just like they do in Russia. Uh, and they're able to have a smaller building, first of all, and it's easier to get at the different components. And they can actually rotate the rocket here with these silver rings so they can uh, very easily work on things. And they don't have to go very far to get the rocket out to the launch pad. Uh, here's another view of a finished rocket before it launches. This was before they were landing them, so it doesn't have the landing legs that they have now. Uh, they let us crawl under one of them <laughs> during one of our visits there, which was kind of fun. They said, just don't touch anything. Uh, so that was kind of neat. And then this was the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. A lot of this has changed. They did have a pretty bad accident there, and they had to rebuild most of it. Um, but uh, the, the pad is very, very close to the building, and they just kind of roll it out and then go vertical with it. And they do that same thing at 39A, uh, where the uh, crewed mission just left from. Very similar concept, not a very long distance to go there. Uh, this was the first orbital capsule that SpaceX launched. They had that on display uh, during that last space shuttle mission, again, to demonstrate that they have the ability to go to orbit as well. Uh, and that was pretty neat to see there, too. So I hope you enjoyed this look back at the end of the space shuttle program and the beginning of the commercial spaceflight era. Uh, we've been doing commercial cargo flights for a while, but the crewed commercial flights just began. And that was something that... Uh, everyone a decade ago when I was doing this coverage 
uh, was hoping would happen, and it finally did. It took a while, but they got there uh, just under 10 years, and now we'll see what happens next. I think there's going to be many more people traveling more frequently to space now that the price has been brought down and they can more quickly turn these space vehicles around to get them back into orbit. And I'm looking forward to occasionally bringing you more of this uh, content in the future. And a lot of what I started doing back then uh, became the channel that you see today because I was filling in the gaps in between space stories with tech coverage. Uh, we've always been focused on general audiences. So yes, there are a lot of great space channels out there, but I was trying to cover space from the standpoint of why should a general member of the public care? And uh, that's what I continue to do. So I'm really uh, excited to bring more of this content to you in the future. And I'm very grateful for the experiences that I had and all the things that I learned that uh, led to this channel becoming a full-time job. Now this week's wrap up is being brought to you by all of you. We had a bunch of super chatters this week during my live streams that includes Carol and Zam, Travis Rhodes, Matthew Stevenson, Clean 937 Samuel, Cajoling Technologies, and Tech Flood. We also have some new supporters to thank who contributed via the many ways in which you can contribute. Uh, Bill Pomerantz contributed to us as a Gold Level member. I want to thank him for his contribution. We're going to be changing the uh, end credit rolls later this week, so stay tuned for that. Uh, Justin Darner uh, contributed via our donor box page, and Keith McDermott contributed via the YouTube membership program. I want to thank everyone for their contributions to the channel this week and everyone who's been supporting the channel on an ongoing basis. I also want to thank all of you who watch on a regular basis too because all of those things equal channel growth. And if you want to help support the channel, you can. You can go to lawntv slash support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. Uh, we also, of course, support that YouTube membership program I mentioned earlier, and you can find that button right down below. So for the Week in Review, we had two live streams. We did a quick one yesterday on the new Command & Conquer Remastered that just came out. I'm not very good at the game, but I have very fond memories of playing it uh, back when it first was released. And now they have a new version that uh, has some upgraded graphics, but really plays identically, I think, to the original. I'm just as bad at this one as I was at the original game. Uh, you can watch me play it there on the live stream. I indexed that one so you can very quickly jump around to see some of the features of this remastered classic. Uh, we also took a look at that Acer Swift 3 that we reviewed on the main channel. Uh, this was the unboxing and initial testing that we did the other night. A lot of you tuned in for that. On the Extras channel, I unboxed another AMD Ryzen uh, chip-based machine. Uh, this is the Lenovo Flex 5, which has the 4500U, and we took it apart to see what was upgradable on it. We'll be reviewing that a little later this week. On the main channel, we had a review of the TCL 10L Android smartphone, a really good value, actually, beautiful display on it. Uh, we also looked at the Mevo Start again because they did update the NDI feature since we last looked at that product, and I wanted to do an update to give it a more fair representation, so you can see that link down below in the master playlist. And of course, the most popular video of the week was the Acer Swift 3 that we were playing around with on that live stream. Uh, this is a much more condensed review of it, and I am super impressed by these new Ryzen processors. This is a, uh, an exceptionally uh, well-performing laptop that's not all that expensive, and I think it might be a really good option for uh, folks going back to college in the fall. So definitely check out uh, that video, especially if you're looking for something inexpensive that can play games somewhat decently. It's a, definitely a good piece of hardware there. Now, one of the things that happened in that video after it was posted was that I got a lot of comments about my hair, and I get comments about my hair every once in a while, but never three in one video. And if you notice here, I just had apparently a better hair day than I usually have during the period of time in which I haven't been able to get my hair cut. Now, we had planned to do a, vid a video, a live stream of me cutting my hair with the Flowbee, which of course is that vacuum cleaner thing. And I was planning to do that, but here's what happened. My uh, wife had somebody come over to cut the kid's hair. Uh, she's a hairdresser professional uh, who decided to, instead of going to work in a salon, actually do a house call service. And she showed up to cut the kid's hair. Uh, she finished a little earlier than she thought. And I said, can you cut my hair? Because my hair was out of control and I just did it. So I apologize for those that were looking forward to that flow B thing. We're going to do it. After my hair grows out a little bit more, I will do the flow B. 
Uh, the problem with the flow B was that I wanted to be able to get to my barber to fix whatever I might damage on my hair with that flow B device so that my hair doesn't look all messed up for future videos. Remember, these videos last a long time on YouTube, and if I look really out of whack, uh, it's going to impact the performance of the video, at least more out of whack than usual. So my barber was backed up because they just allowed them to reopen, and the timing just wasn't working right, and I really needed a haircut. So we will come back to the flow B. It'll happen probably in the next month or so when the hair grows back out. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to let you all know, as I know some of you will be disappointed with the fact that I've been talking about it forever and never did it. I do intend to do it. We'll get to it, but just not right at this very moment. But this week on the channel, we do have a bunch of stuff that we'll be looking at. I already shot this video. I got in a little while ago the uh, Unify Dream Machine, uh, which is kind of a prosumer router that is based on the uh, Ubiquity Network's Unify system. And I love it. And I've actually set up a bunch of VLANs to isolate networks, and I'm going to show you how I am using that uh, in my home right now to isolate my IoT devices from the rest of my network while using the same access points and router. It's worked tremendously well, and it's giving me some peace of mind that I didn't have with my old router. So I've been really happy with this, and I'll show you how I did it. I will also be reviewing that Lenovo Flex with the AMD processor. That'll be coming up a little later this week. Uh, and also, hopefully, I'll be getting in my Fire HD 8 Plus from Amazon that I ordered the other day. It was sent overnight. Uh, it was supposed to hit me on Friday, and it still hasn't shown up yet because UPS is totally backlogged. So hopefully, we'll get it in today. I may have a little live stream that went up before this video was posted if it does come in at the right time. Uh, so we'll start playing around with that and see what their new, more premium, low-cost tablet will deliver. And if we get time, we'll take a look at this uh, network switch we were playing around with on a live stream last week from QNAP. This is like everything, and including the kitchen sink kind of device. It's got uh, power over Ethernet. It's got a built-in NAS. It's, of course, a switch that you can run your network from. Just a really neat device that has everything you need in one package. And we'll be taking a look at that if we have some time. If not, we'll try to get to it next week. Now, if you like what I do and want to get notified whenever I go live, you can hit that notification bell to let you know whenever I am around. Uh, and it will also notify you when we upload videos. We've got other channels that you can find here on screen. Uh, you can engage with the channel in a bunch of different ways, including our Facebook group, which is a great source of ideas for this show and many other things that I cover here on the channel. So join us if you haven't already. We've got almost 1,000 people there. And then we have my store where I sell previously used items. Uh, at the store, you will soon, not at the moment, but you will soon find uh, the Acer AMD laptop and the Lenovo because I bought both of those. And what I do is I buy things to review, and then I review them, I put them back in the box, and then sell them. And they're very lightly used because they've only been used a few times, and we sell them for less than retail, but there's only one of everything. So if you want to get notified uh, when those items are put on the store, you can sign up for my email alert, and I'll email you once those items are put up there. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap-up. Definitely a longer show than usual. Let me know what you thought about that and whether or not you actually made it to the end here. Uh, thank you all for your continued support of the channel. I really appreciate that. And I would love to get some feedback from all of you as to what topics you'd like to see me cover on this show in the weeks ahead. My list of ideas is starting to run a bit low. Uh, so let me know down in the comments section or over on the Facebook group uh, because that'll certainly help plan out uh, the next month or two. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Rick Vestudo, Chris Allegretta, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more.
And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.